at all this week, then I'm sure you will agree that we have been tremendously blessed in this place. Dr. Bishop Felton Smith has really uh, been a godsend in more than one way. A man who's a friend of Bishop Clark who truly knows his spirit and knows his people. And I do want him to know that we are comfortable in his hands as God uses him and speaks through him. And we are very appreciative of this great man of God. We've really been enlightened, inspired, encouraged. We've been blessed. So would you stand to your feet and receive Dr. Bishop Felton Smith. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, there's something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance. After the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim King. Shall all pass away, but there's something about And the Lord's people said, Amen. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege and blessing of entering into this place hallowed to thy name. We ask your divine favor upon us as we worship further in this time and season. Thank you for the legacy of Bishop Melvin Eugene Clark Sr. And thank you for Bishop Wallace, who for 64 years walked beside him in his shadow under his anointing recipient of his benevolent gift and now executing as the will of the man of God would be thank you for this people these powerful elders and ministers deacons and staff and mothers missionaries and congregation who so faithfully do all they can to share themselves that this ministry finds perpetuation and maturation. I'm here because I'm summoned by you and at the behest of these who loved our leader so much. 
Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in that sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Shake a hand, if you will, and tell them we're glad to see you. Listen, I pray that you will get into the habit of never, ever forgetting Bishop Melvin Eugene Clark Sr. In our congregation, there's not a Sunday or a service to go by. There's not a time that we meet, whether it's by Zoom or conference call or in person, that Mother Connie's name does not come up because she, with me, added so much value to the ministry. And who can forget when lives are changed and transformed, lifted, motivated, encouraged, inspired, and just brought to a state of God consciousness. And I don't care what occasion, I don't care what time, what hour, what day, this ministry was in the hands of one of the greatest leaders and icons in the entire world. So you can never, ever forget that. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, we give deference and give praise to God for the legacy and the life and memory of the iconic Bishop Melvin Eugene Clark. I want you to put your hands together and give a rousing ovation. We are yet under the auspices of Bishop J. Drew Sheard, who is our esteemed presiding bishop. And because he is such a consummate leader, he has released unto us through the hand of your interim jurisdictional prelate, Bishop Malcolm Colby, Bishop Bernard Wallace to carry on the Lord's work here. And we thank God for that. Ladies and gentlemen, let's show our love for Bishop Bernard Wallace as he faithfully executes what God has designed. I want to thank you for your splendid demeanor and how you have collected yourselves. And I want to applaud the mother's board, the impeccable oh, yeah. executive women mothers in Zion who thought it not Robert to put their best forward and bless the ministry with what they have generated through their sagacity, $35,000. And then this wonderful presentation for the budgetary concerns of the local church they've tendered on this day, $5,000 for that purpose, listen, we need to stand up and show them we love them all over the house. Show these mothers you love and appreciate their effort. Wow, wow, wow. It's wonderful. I thank you for being so kind and considerate of me. Uh, I've been asked to be here today. And I'm proud. This is home for me. I'm family to you. Oh, yeah. And uh, I thank God for everything. You mentioned about Coach Dixon. Um, he has uh, been afforded an opportunity that few will have uh, at his Church of God in Christ, predominantly. Are pastors and few of them are elders without charge. They have been elders for some time. It is rare that a person who is a non clergy person to be given that 
opportunity. And it is one of great impetus. It touches unilaterally every age group in the Church of God in Christ. It embodies five departments, that being youth, Sunday school, missions, music, and what other? What did I say? Evangelism. Now, those persons who serve equally or will serve from that perspective must be proven by the Church of God in Christ. They will go through a background check. They will uh, go through the training, sexual harassment, because we need to know and vet people who are over and interface and intersect with our people. We don't want predators. We don't want insignificant people. We don't want perpetrators. We don't want people who will take advantage of our young folk who may be so inspired that it leads to naivety. It's a mammoth task, but he has coached uh, young men and uh, from the lowest of uh, secondary education to college to the NFL. And he brings to us a concept of what coaching is, what teamwork looks like. And at the end of the service, before we end, he's going to have a few minutes to thank you and thank Bishop Wallace for the opportunity to serve. So the best way for us to be given prime consideration is to be functional, is to be busy, is to produce, is to make things happen. And so while we may have been in a lull coming out of COVID, we have now full regalia and opportunity to be as busy as we can be. This church has been a busy church, a productive church. And Bishop Clark knew the value of collective and keeping the people busy, moving, doing, having, becoming, and exercising their gifts that makes for a better outcome. So we're going to get busy again. I'm here in the capacity of consultant. I am not in charge. I am given charge to do some things, and that's important because your gift can never be fully expressed unless you're given opportunity to express it. I consider myself, after 70 years of preaching, an expert of sort in certain areas. But here's where wisdom come in. Not only must you know what you know, you got to know what you don't know and stop trying to pretend like you do when you don't. So I'm giving a disclaimer. I don't know everything, but I bet you one thing. What I know, I know well. All right. And I'm going to give you the best of myself. Ezekiel 34, 11 and 12 I was uh, thinking about what to say. Sometimes there's talk among people, and other times there's family talk. There's a different kind of talk when you're talking to family. My father fell ill. He had had an accident years before in at combustion, which was a steel mill. And it hit him and it hurt his kidney, but he didn't have 
problems until it manifests years later, 25, 30 plus years later. And one day he came to my house. Mother Connie was upstairs and she came down, sat in my den, and my father loved the soap operas. As the world turned, and all my children, young and restless, days of our lives at the edge of night. Um, and if he couldn't, because he was downtown doing some business, my house was between downtown and his house further in the suburbs. So he would stop at 722 Tally Road, sit in my chair. And I don't care what I'm watching, mostly the news. He changed the channel and watched everyone he wanted to. And then he said, well, I guess I'm going on now. And he's satisfied, you know, he's seen his soap opera. And he would always ask Mother Connie, Connie, are you all right? Yes, Papa Smith, I'm all right. He usually pull out about $500 and give it to her. He said, because if I give it to him, he's going to give it away. I'm giving it to you. And she said, thank you. And he was going about his business. But this one day, my father said, well, when that time comes, I want you to say it good. I said, Dad, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, that day going to come. I want you to say it good. He already requested me to preach his funeral. I preached all my family members' funerals who passed. I want you to say it good. The day did come. My father expired. But before he did, we made sure that the house was in good order, modern ranch-style home, and my mom's name on that deed and successor in receivership. As an addendum, we made sure that Sandra, my only sister, should be the receiver ultimately at the demise of my mom to have the house, 5603 Wygelia Drive. With all of that intact, after those years, 10 years prior to my mother's transition, everything was in order. By then I had moved to Nashville, Hendersonville. My youngest brother is in, New is in uh, Las Vegas, lived in New Orleans during Katrina and transferred out, ended up in Las Vegas. My other brother, James, was staying with my parents and my next to the youngest brother, Dr. Van Smith, had his own home. All of us had our own home. We made a conscious decision, family talk. We take care of that so there will be no aftershocks in the end. So Sandra is now the receiver and owner of the home, paid for. But then while my mom was sick and declining, my daughter who lives with me, who was living in Chattanooga at the time, helped to take care of my mother on a daily basis. Then my niece, Sandra's oldest daughter, whose husband was an elder, is now a pastor. She's now first lady. We decided let Tammy have the house before mother transitioned because they moved in, livestock and barrel, their two children, and aided and assisted to take care of my mother. There need not be any family squabblings and issues about a house. Let's just make the right decision. Now we could say, sell it. All of us benefit from it. We could say I'm the eldest child. I should have it and it's impossible to live in two houses in two cities 
at the same time. So we made a conscious decision to do the right thing for the right reason so that we take the edge off and take the concerns of my mom and all family members off the table. Family talk. Now when all of that happened at the end of my mom's journey, Tammy and her husband and children were in the home. Sandra had her house and she and her second daughter decided they would live together. And then as time went on, she married again. Her husband had passed away. They got another house. But Pastor Bonner, Paul Bonner, First Lady Ivy Tomiko Bonner carry on in the home that my parents built in 1961. Full regalia. You own it. It's yours. I have memories growing up, but you have responsibility that I don't have. I got responsibility at 628 Cumberland Hills Drive, Hendersonville, Tennessee. I don't have this load and responsibility of maintenance and care and paying utilities and all of that. I got one house I need to take care of. And in Mother Connie's transition, I don't have that responsibility no more because my daughter does everything that needs to be done. Sometimes you're holding on to stuff when God wants you to turn it loose because a greater blessing is ahead of you. You want to be playing the game of tit for tat? You want the spirit of greed to overwhelm you? You want to be so minuscule and so minimal, squeezing sand in your hand and losing all the time because you can't squeeze sand and hold the sand you squeeze. It squeezes right through your fingers. Yesterday is gone. It'll never come back. And what you need to do is profit from yesterday's blessing. Wisdom, knowledge, disseminating of that wisdom and knowledge to you. I had, I think I mentioned this some time ago. I had a seventh grade teacher, Miss Alma Moore. She was my homeroom teacher and my math teacher. I'm a straight A student. But Miss Moore would not give me an A in math. About a quarter of the year, school year, I had the audacity to confront her at the end of class. She would give me B plus, A minus, never an A, certainly not an A plus. Had all the equations right. I didn't miss anything. She said to me, sit down. A little young preacher started at age seven. This is seventh grade. She said, sit down. And she quoted to me, to whom much is given, much is required. She said, I watch you every day. You take your pencils and you doodle and beat on the desk. You, you, you got nervous energy. You finish in half the time of the next best student. You got greater potential than what's being realized. I'm not going to give you an A until you reach your potential. So she proposed, sent sent a note to my parents that she's going to give me twice the work of the entire class. I felt like that's unfair. That's not right. And when my mother got the note, 
My mother, almost like she was in church, started celebrating. My father said, I agree. I went back to school. The next day, subject to doing twice the work of the next best student. My first anniversary as a pastor, my sister invited Miss Alma Moore to come to that service. She stood up to talk to say how proud she was of me. Before that service ended, I stood up with my remarks and thanked her for motivating me and driving me to my best self. I could have resolved myself in lassadaisicalness. I could have stayed status quo. I could have bragged about how smart I was over everybody in the class and diminished myself because I did not work my own potential. To whom much is given, much is required. You got to look at the word require. We're required to have driver's license if you're going to operate a vehicle. You're required to have insurance. You're required to register in various forms. You're required to keep up if you're in a fraternity or sorority. You're required to go to school at the appropriate age, five plus age six, you're required to go to school or take an approved curricula if you're homeschooled. There are many areas you're required. You're required to drive the speed limit, although most of you don't. Still required. And you know that requirement once you get stopped. You, 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 uh, you didn't meet the requirement. It's required that you do your best all the time. And do it without somebody standing over your shoulder, right. looking over you, making demands of you. This is self-motivation, self-actualization, self-assertiveness. You got to make up your mind. That's what you're going to do. And you're going to make it happen. If you're going to be your best, know this, less than your best is sin. And if you don't ever do your best all the time, I used to get criticized because I was on radio when I was age 11, my own broadcast. Had my first telecast when I was 17. Through the years, people would criticize me and talk about me because I was fluid, articulate, intelligent, use all these highfalutin words. Well, I learned them as a child. I read the dictionary. I read the thesaurus. I read the Encyclopedia Britannica. I read the Bible from cover to cover three times. And words were germane to me. It was natural instinct. I articulated, I learned to incorporate them in a sentence and project them out in an idea. So why can't I communicate this? You want me to come down when I'm trying to lift you up. Go learn some words. I teach my children and the young folk in our jurisdiction and our local church, learn a way. I was going to talk to you all about sheep. I'm going to back off of that because what I need to say is so entrenched. I'm going to need time to articulate it. So when Bishop Wallace invited me to come back, it'll probably be my first message <laughs> talk about sheep. But I want to talk about Jesus calling 12 disciples, and I'm not going to go way into it, 
but just enough to know he called uh, a conglomerate of backgrounds and, and they were unrelated. He didn't call all skilled laborers. Every one of them were common individuals and two of them were common thieves. They're boys from the hood. <laughs> and Jesus saw value in them. He saw something of great potential. The greatest mind that could ever be discovered by any individual the greatest is a criminal. You'll never know a real criminal. You'll never go to the house. You're going to kill him. And you'll learn how to crack that safe. They come in with tools. They know how to break in your house. And you can leave your keys in your house or lose your keys and can't get in your own house. Call a thief. <laughs> He'll get you in. And then call the police. <laughs> but that mindset, Jesus says, I see value. That's what happened with Saul of Tarsus. He knew his value. Not that he was an attorney. Not that he was academic. Not that he had been in the Sanhedrin. Not that he had been a part of the group of religiosity and had aspired to the highest level of attainment religiously. But because he has such a negative view of both Jesus and his disciples, that Jesus said this negativity can be transformed into positivity. This kind of impetus and drive and stamina and relentlessness and tenacity can be used to the glory of God. And the very people he called Saul to were suspect of him. Right. They feared him. And yet, it was he who the Lord wanted to use. Isn't it amazing the last becomes first? He was back of the line, but now he's head of the line, chief apostle. Never catechized by any school, although he was fluent in academia. But he had to go into exile three and a half years, and it is then and there that the Lord himself mentors and tutors him. Best education you can get is from God. There's some things like seminary. They don't teach you budgetary items. They don't teach you uh, how to get along with people. They give you a little tidbits of social science and psychology, all of that. But don't none of them prepare you for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're a different breed. And, and, and there's an us in us, and that us in us is we're going to have it our way or else. You, you, you go to conventions and conferences and see how we act out. We live in the ghetto, but when we get there, we act fabulous. I want this and demand this and, and talk down to folk and the servers and the waitress and waiters and, and the people at the desk at the hotel. And oh, yeah, we something else to deal with now. And, and, you, and we do it unapologetically. We're going to have our way. The late Bishop J.O. Patterson Sr. said there is three kinds of folk. Yes. Right folk, wrong folk, church of God and Christ folk. <laughs> we, we're different. So the disciples came from a myriad of backgrounds. And Jesus, with only three and a half years to mentor them, that takes eight to 10 years to become 
a doctor. It takes tantamount to six to seven years to become an attorney. And you have to have mentorship, tutoring. You got to go into practice. You just can't go out there and start a practice on your own because you, you, you got to get your bearings right. You can't be released to just open up a practice as a doctor. You got to go into internship. And then you become board certified. Et cetera, et cetera. But we'll take a person right off the street. Let them come into church speaking in tongues. Say six months after they get saved, God called them to preach. Six months after that, you give them license. Less than a year after that, you ordain them. They got a collar on and they're in church six months before they want to start pastoring. They get up spreading ignorance, don't know much about the Bible, haven't studied, no intense study, no challenges uh, in terms of comprehension and understanding and rightly dividing the word of truth. None of that. We just happy that they get up spreading the ignorance and saying exciting things. Don't let them come in church like coach have been in the NFL and been uh, uh, NBA and been in entertainment like Samuel Jackson. And we come to, we so glad to have them. And next thing you know, they run a rough shot over the church. And, and thank God for these mothers at the round. Because I've seen some mothers, boy, go ahead, son, go ahead. <laughs> Pushing them all the way. Jesus says, I see value in what is perceived to be of no value. Because what he sees is potential, endless possibility. So why couldn't we diversify? Why, why can't we look geographically at some areas and let sons and daughters out of the mother church. Go on a Tuesday night. Over here north, northwest, northeast, south, southwest, southeast, central. Have prayer and Bible study. Over in communities that need a witness. <clears throat> you ain't taking them full regalia from the church. You're giving them assignments. You're expanding your scope you have, and your reach. Communities and pockets of areas that have no witness. There's no greater witness than the witness of the church in the round. First Church of God in Christ. Great witness. May I present Jesus to you. Then come back, invite them. Join me Sunday morning. Be a part of a vibrant, healthy, life-inducing motivating, inspiring service that will lift you to the highest height and give you perspective and your walk with Jesus that aids with you because what you get here will fuel what you're trying to do there. Now you're growing exponentially. You're utilizing skills rather than sit here looking deadhead and looking at me and wishing I get through. Now your gift is being manifest in you. You're not going out at that point pastoring. You are a subsidiary. And you're making a difference. Then eventually as it must room and grow and mature and maturate, then we can solidify that aspect of ministry. But you're involved. You're touching lives. You're being active. You're exercising your gift. Jesus knew that Judas was a thief. He, knew it. he can't, you can't make claim that he knew everything and didn't know that he was a thief. But he gave treasure to him. An opportunity to manifest who you are. Don't tell me God don't know who you are. 
that way, you become sensitized to the demands and the efforts and the burdens on the shoulder of Bishop Wallace. Now you got a greater understanding because all of us were students of, and almost everyone here right now was a son and daughter of Bishop Clark. But now you don't know all the intricacies because so much that Bishop as a father kept from you. He bore them because he was so used to carrying heavy loads. He prevented you from being taken out too soon in discovery of certain things and certain personalities and certain people. He kept that from you. But now you're exposed to a son of the ministry. And sons got to get together and work together and make it happen together. Every time I go to my brother's house, the one I told you about, Dr. Van Smith, he started playing for me when he was 11 years old. He was already playing for our former church. He was a minister of music at eight years old. Child prodigy started playing at two years old. But every time I go to his house and visit, he always put money in my hand because he said, I will always value not just my elder brother, but as my priest, as my man of God. He was with me for 35 years in ministry at the local church before I transitioned to Nashville. You got to be able to see your brother now as your priest. All right. Saying something. Yeah. God, I thank you. Yeah. The greatest release you can have is to be unselfishly devoted to the things of God. Get yourself out of the way and say, God, I'm your vessel. Use me as you will, but use me to be able to give my gifts yet to another. Because many times, your gift, if you've ever read uh, the book by Nance that deals with God's armor bearer, he served Happy Caldwell in Little Rock, Arkansas. He wanted to travel the world. He had the gifts. He had the smarts, the intellect, et cetera. He even had the opportunity. And God said, take all your treasure, all your emphasis, everything you have, and pour it into and put it behind Happy Caldwell. They built a glorious ministry of tens of thousands of people in Little Rock, Arkansas. It is then the door started opening. He got to be noticed serving. Doors open because he served. Great things happened. He went around the world because he served. He made big what was soon to be magnanimous, but it was such a natural status quo ministry. A few hundred. Four, five, six hundred folk. But he gave his best as though he was senior pastor without being senior pastor. He made good of being the best at number two, serving number one. You got the example. Mr. Wallace could have got, been full of himself. Surely. He could have left any time. But he made number two the best in serving number one. Yes. Come on, give it to him. Well, this is not the best sermon I've ever preached, but it's good enough for the day. I started preaching up sermon. I mean, that, what? I see. You, you, I see. I, yeah, I got notes. I ain't never, never leave home without them. <laughs> <laughs> but this family talk. We come together. We find out what the need is, and we meet that need. And after you have your family talk, you don't talk after family talk. No. Ain't nobody's business that ain't family. Nobody. We're family. 
It's a shame that the world beat us at our own game. There's a song out that says, we are family. The saints ought to be singing that song. But you let the world get to you first. We're family. Let's stay family. I hope you can appreciate my efforts today. I love you dearly. I love you dearly. I want to come before you. I have, well, when I first came here, the Holy Ghost spoke to me about Bishop Clark and started showing me things about him. And he embraced me, I embraced him. Phenomenal. And so the burden of this ministry on his behalf was on my shoulder in times of execution. I've revisited that anointing. And this time, not only does it involve all of you, including all of them who should be here, I've learned to keep going and make strides without being so limited by those who are not here. Will not hear. I don't cry over spilled milk. It is what it is. I don't sit up and worry why they did this and why why I could care less. And some things I'll never know. What I know is God has equipped me for continuance. And you make the adjustments and keep moving. I've had great opportunities in life because I kept moving. I was on television. I received a call from Dr. Hollis Green, Caucasian former Church of God preacher, a scholar, taught at Luther Rice Seminary. He had finished his tenure there and was adjunct professor at Oxford. He said, I watch your program and the Spirit of the Lord told me to mentor you and open a door for you. I was oblivious to anything in that realm. Didn't know anything potential existed. Said, I'd like to set up an appointment and come to your office and talk to you about it. He set that appointment up, he came. He said to me, Dr. Smith, I want to offer you a full ride to Oxford. Close to nine, close to a hundred thousand dollars, eighty-five thousand plus perks, close to a hundred thousand dollars per annum. We'll pay for your travel with this, with that, etc. And I went to Oxford full ride. I prayed and asked God about the local church. Pastor Willie L. Jefferson, who was with me then, administrator like Bishop Wallace served, said, Dr. Smith, don't worry, we got it. My family corralled behind, my parents corralled behind, and that church never missed a beat. Tithe, offerings, giving, services, Activities, ministries kept right on going while I was away. Never worried about him cutting my throat, stabbing me in the back, trying to use his influence. None of that. I was away for months and come home for a few days, sometime a week, depending on what time of year, and go back to Oxford. Full ride. Now, it's a different design. It's the oldest degree, doctoral degree in the world. And we had to do term papers, 10 a day, double spaced. We had to regurgitate the authors or those we read. But in doing so, we could not quote them. We had to interpret them. Had to be in our own language. It had to be no less than 10 pages, no more than 20. 
per challenge. Not only that, we could not quote any reference without proving its authenticity, its value, its merit. We couldn't even quote the scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc. until we prove the validity of the entire Bible itself, its veracity, its historical standard. Before you can quote from it, you have to prove that the document is authentic. Then we couldn't do the preachments because most of us in this program at the School of Religion were preachers. So our presentation could not sound like a sermon. It, it, it had to be proven. Intelligentsia, it had to be proven scientifically. It had to be proven of his own merits and weight. And I did that gruelingly for two years to receive a D-field degree, the oldest doctoral degree in the world. Only person of color, resolved coming from the South, I'm never less than, maybe no more than, but certainly just as good as. Dr. D. Dunn Brooks received his doctorate in clinical psychology at Georgia State University, pastored out in College Park, First Baptist Church, decided he was going to make me an example had me to stand up and call my name, Dr. Felton Matthew Smith, Jr. You know, you know when you call my whole name, it's serious. <laughs> he said, sir, I perceive that you are prejudiced. So glad as you know, my blood pressure went all the way up to 99. I said, who are you talking to? God used him. He starts stripping layer after layer after layer after layer after layer. He said, you're the most intelligent person in this class. He said, I'm challenging your prejudicial attitude that you're erudite, somewhat egotistical. Determine that you're better than the rest of us. You don't socialize with us. You don't this, you don't that. He started peeling layers away. So much so until it reached my heart. He said, the reason I'm doing this is not to embarrass you. I'm not doing this to showcase anything. I'm not doing this because somehow or another I want to get at you because you're the only person of color in this class. I'm doing it because the world needs you and you're not ready to meet the demands of the world with your attitude. It's more in you than you ever know. Watching you and observing you and all the professors who have observed you and see your writ and hear your presentations and you got so much to offer to the world, but you're diminishing yourself because your attitude is a stumbling block. God called you to go into all the world not just part of it. You got to overcome yourself in order to win the loss. There are people of every hue, every background, every culture that God is going to privy to come to be a part of church and around. Just get out the way. And let God have his way. Amen, somebody. Here's the end of that. Dr. D. Don Brooks became one of my best friends till the Lord called him home. Crazy as a road lizard. I mean, I mean he, could, he would get in your face unabashedly, unashamedly. 
But he and I got to be the best of friends because he had the audacity to confront me by my own ills. Growing up in the South, Jim Crow law, this happening, seeing water fountains with negative names on them. You can't go here. You can't drink here. Can't go in this restroom. Can't be in this. You can't do this. You got to walk on the other side of the street to not be confronted with someone else and all this. You got to hold your head down and never look at a white woman and all this kind of stuff. I had to overcome it in order for me to be effective. To that own self be true. You got to confront your own demons. Amen, somebody. I know this is not the fanciest message in the world, but it's all I had. <laughs> Amen. Y'all got some soup today, but it's, it's that old-fashioned soup. You know, they throw everything in that, in that pot. Amen. Stand to your feet, everybody. I, we got to go home. <laughs> Thank you, Saunders. I love you. Do me a favor. I want us to gather as a family around the altar. Just everybody, just squeeze in around the altar. And this time, I'm going to have the elders, ministers, bishop. You can hold your place because this is really all about you. We're going to be the people that God wants to insulate you and love you and cover you and support you and follow you with whatever God placed on your heart. Elder Sunders, please gather the men of God and minister to these precious saints. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of salvation. That's it. Help me. Yeah. To everyone, everyone that believes, and to everyone, everyone that receives, for ever. Go ahead.